All right, I'm back again, this time in the morning, because my roommate's not here. If you guys can tell, my voice is a little messed up. I guess I was playing with the boys a little too late last night, and for some reason, my knees are a little scratched up, too. I don't really get that one, but who knows. So anyways, today we're going to talk about the architecture of HDFS and figure out why that works the way it does and how they're able to achieve high throughput both on reads and writes. And then that will allow us to segue hopefully pretty easily into HBase and see kind of the good reasons to use something like that. Okay, so HDFS and the design of it. Just to give a background, I've mentioned distributed file systems in the past, but basically they're a really important component of a ton of large-scale distributed systems. Um, even though HDFS is probably the most popular one, it itself is based off the Google file system, which is a paper that came out well over a decade ago now. And because of the fact that HDFS can be run on just normal desktop computers, it's really popular. Obviously, there's a big wave to be able to just like spin up instances of things using things like ECT, uh, EC2 clusters or just Amazon Web Services in general. So even though HDFS is really useful for things like batch processing, and we've talked about this with MapReduce, Spark, and Tez, um, HDFS is really, really good for a database building block so that you can provide an extra layer to kind of interact with the data on HDFS and then ultimately run a ton of computations on it. Okay, so just to give an overview, as you can see on the right, um, you're going to see a ton of terms that you don't know yet, but by the end of this video you will. So generally speaking, Hadoop is designed to basically be able to write a file once and then, you know, from then on you can append or truncate it, but generally speaking, just read it many times over. The way this is done is by storing them in chunks across a bunch of different data nodes, and typically these are around 64 or 128 megabyte chunks, and the reason you do that is to improve the parallelism of both reading and writing big files. Oftentimes these files are gigabytes or maybe even terabytes in size, and as a result having to write them all sequentially would be terrible. And then finally, in order to ensure availability and no lost data, chunks are obviously going to be replicated. Okay, so the first um, component of HDFS that we have to talk about is probably the most important one, and that's going to be called the name node. So the name node, generally speaking, is where all of the metadata regarding files is stored. So that includes things like names, but not only does it just hold the names of the files and perhaps even their subdirectories, if it is a directory, but more importantly, it has to keep track of all the chunks, so basically all of the data nodes where those chunks are located, as well as their corresponding version numbers. Like I said, you can append or truncate files, and doing so would increment the version number of it. Okay, so how does it do this? Well, it keeps all of that metadata in memory. All of the changes to file system memory go to something, er, sorry, all of the changes to file system metadata go to something called the edit log. So the edit log is effectively just a write ahead log for the name node, because obviously if we had to, you know, like go ahead and change kind of disk state every single time, or, or some persistent state of the entire state of the file system, those writes would not be sequential and they would take longer. So what we do is we put them to a write ahead log, um, change the state in memory, and then occasionally checkpoint that state on disk to something called an FS image file. And then if uh, the name node ever crashes and has to reboot, the FS image checkpoint file in conjunction with whatever edit log writes come after that checkpoint can be combined to create a new um, state for the name node. Okay, in terms of continuing to talk about the name node, uh, it actually only keeps the location of all the chunks uh, only in memory. So when it first boots, what happens is the name node goes into safe mode and it's going to receive something called a block report from each data node where the data node is going to tell it which chunks are held on that data node. The name node is then going to compile all of this information, construct that local state, and say here's where the chunks are located, and say now it sees that um, only one replica is holding a given chunk, and you know the user is say specified a replication factor of three for that chunk. It's gonna say, okay, we don't have enough replicas for this no uh, chunk in particular, Let's go ahead and um, add some additional replicas for it. So go ahead and replicate that chunk to two other nodes, and that way we can reach the replication threshold. The same thing will occur if a name node assumes that a given data node is dead because it hasn't received any heartbeats from it for a while. Okay, now let's talk about replication. So replication in Hadoop is something called rack aware. And this is really important because it allows for both maximizing availability and throughput. So we'll talk about that in a second. 
Um, chunks are going to be replicated in a way that not only reduces latency for clients, but also reduces the possibility of all the replica nodes going down because of the fact that they're put in a different rack or data center. So for example, for the default replication factor of three, Hadoop is gonna put one replica on the same rack as the writer, and then two replicas on the same remote random rack. Uh, the reason they put them in the same random rack is just to minimize network bandwidth. You don't have to go to two different racks. And since we have kind of a synchronous replication here where we wait for all of these writes to complete, it's actually pretty important that all of these replicas complete their write as fast as possible. It's not eventually consistent, so I'll touch upon that in a second. So, how does replication actually work? Well, there's something called pipelining. Basically, the replicas are arranged into some order, and the data is pipelined from one replica to the next. On a write or an append or a truncate, writes are only considered successful from the client's point of view if all of the replicas in this pipeline actually acknowledge them. So even though in theory this should lead to strong consistency, the issue is that, say, the first replica receives a write, it's going to go ahead and commit that to itself, so it's going to perform the write, and then the second and third replicas don't ever actually acknowledge the write, meaning that you know they didn't perform them themselves. Well, the client is going to receive a failure for its write. However, um, it's going to be the case that the write is still in one of the replicas. So generally speaking, when a client receives a failure on a write, um, it needs to just keep retrying until it receives a success message. So as you can see, uh, the first replica is going to send that write to the second one, which sends the write to the third one, which then sends the acknowledgement back and back again. So once this whole process is complete, the client sees its write as successful. Okay, in terms of reading in Hadoop, basically all that happens here is the client is going to query the master, or when I say the master, in this case I mean the name node, to get a list of data nodes carrying the chunk that it wants. It's going to figure out which data node is closest to it, because like I said, Hadoop is aware of the rack that the nodes are in, and as a result of that, it can say for a given client, which one is probably going to have minimal network latency when communicating with it. So you choose the best data node to read from, you're going to cache this result on the client in the case that you want to read that file again, because like I said, write once, read many times, and then the client's going to just go ahead and perform that read. Okay, in terms of doing writes, this is a little bit more complex, but I'll have a visualization after I walk through this process. So to append to a file, go ahead and reach out to the name node, see the data nodes where the chunk is located. And then you have to pick something called a primary replica. This is going to be the first replica in that replication pipeline. If there's already a primary and the lease for the primary is still valid because the, you know, the lease basically says how long until there's no longer a primary, perform the write to the primary replica, let it go through the chain of replication. Otherwise, we need to pick a primary replica. How can we do this? Well, we look at the data nodes that the, the chunk is located on and pick one of them with the most up-to-date version of that chunk. If it doesn't exist, we have a data loss problem and hopefully this never comes up. Once the primary replica is determined, all the other replicas are considered secondary. Um, we kind of establish that um, path for the replication, and then the client is going to make the write to the primary replica and you know, hope to get a success result. Okay, so to actually visualize this, let's say I'm trying to write Jordan's nudes.png. We've got three replicas, replica one, two, and three. And the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to uh, go ahead and ask the name node for what chunks are holding it and try and find out what the leader was. So I find out that the leader was replica 3 because, as you can see, it has version 23 of the file there, but that's since expired. So what are we going to do? We're going to randomly pick a replica with an up-to-date version number as the leader. So now the leader is going to be R1. And let's say we have a lease that expires in an hour for it because replica one also has version 23. It could have been one or three here. Now all that's gonna happen is we're going to go ahead and contact replica one, which is the leftmost one in the bottom there, and send the right through it and let it propagate, propagate through the pipeline. Okay, so what are some issues with Hadoop? Well, if you've been paying attention so far, you may have noticed that I've only mentioned one name node which is obviously a problem. What happens if the name node goes down? Well, everything crashes. <laughs> so in the original Hadoop implementation, um, there was kind of like this hacky way of solving things called a secondary name node, which was basically just like a standby name node that went ahead and tried to take in all those changes. But there's actually a better way of solving this, and it uses coordination services like I talked about in the last video. So this is known as high availability HDFS. 
What do we actually do? Well, keep in mind that the name node, basically the, the main persistence point of the name node that you can use to derive the state of the name node is the edit log. So the edit log is basically just going to keep track of all that file metadata changes, such as renaming files, creating a new directory, anything along those lines. And so instead of just keeping all of those changes locally to the name node, what we're going to do is go ahead and use something like um, a few Zookeeper nodes to create a replicated log, which represents the edit log. This in Hadoop turns is known as the Quorum Journal Manager. So anyways, after we have this replicated log, we can now have a second instance of a name node, which you know we'll just call it the backup for now. And all it's going to do is read that replicated log and keep its state up to date in the same way that the name node does. So by using uh, this coordination service here, we're actually able to keep a secondary no name node relatively up to date. So in the event that the first one goes down, uh, you know, say we have uh, the coordination service also has a distributed lock. The first one goes down, it'll no longer be holding that distributed lock. And then the second one can grab the distributed lock to basically say, I'm the leader now, I am going to be the name node. Okay. So in conclusion, um, HDFS can provide really high read and write throughput by using a rack-aware replication schema and uh, reading as well. Um, this is super useful. And in addition to that, while the original HDFS um, kind of design wasn't very fault tolerant, the fact that they've now added a coordination service to it is great for kind of that leader failover of the name node and allows high availability. Obviously, HDFS isn't perfect. Like I said, it kind of aims for strong consistency, but in reality, you might have data inconsistencies and have to handle this in your application code. But on the whole, HDFS is really good for storing data in conjunction with large-scale compute. We're going to see that plenty of databases are built on top of HDFS in order to kind of provide a better programming interface and allow for more complicated querying of it. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in my next video. Um, so I hope this one was useful, guys, and welcome to all the new subscribers again, and I'll see you soon.